Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we discussed today on the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam how Dhritarashtra went from having many experiences to becoming experienced. The first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam sets the setting for the Bhagavatam itself. And we all have many experiences in life. But just having experiences doesn't necessarily uh, improve, make one experienced. Because to be experienced is to be about having good judgment, the capacity to make wise decisions, the capacity to understand understand life's realities and to respond to them wisely. Now, if you look at scripture, the primary purpose of scripture is to help us learn how to live our life wisely. The Bhagavad Gita is not primarily a book about war, although it is spoken on the battlefield. And when Arjuna has faced with the question, what do I do? Should I fight or should I not fight? Now sometimes to understand one, understand one thing, we have to change how we understand everything. To understand one thing, we have to change how we understand everything. Why? Because that one thing is so oh, confusing. That so complex that it cannot be understood in isolation. So for Arjuna to understand, should I fight or should I not fight this war? So he had to change his understanding of everything. His understanding of everything means, okay, who am I? What is life meant for? Because normally we all go through life with certain assumptions about how life is meant to be lived. And those assumptions do work for us during the normal framework of life. So, to think that I am the body and to live accordingly, it's, it's you could say, the normal way of living. And it does work for some of the time. But it's when uh, we lose our bodily capacity. It's either, when we, either we lose somebody loud one or we lose our own capacity to move mobility or whatever then suddenly our capacity to live gets deprived and then at that time we question our assumptions about life okay what is life meant for so it is to answer that question we need to question everything and without it questioning everything if we superimpose our own conceptions, then we don't really gain proper understanding. So the Bhagavatams, Prabh Prabhupada also says in one purport, that the purpose of the Krishna consciousness movement is to change how people think. It is not just to change what we think about. Yes, of course, we want to think about Krishna. But unless we change how we think, we will otherwise fit Krishna into our own existing way of thinking and our worldview. So Krishna will just become another object of maybe pious entertainment. Krishna is the not just not an object of pious entertainment. He is the objective of perennial enlightenment. He, when we become enlightened, we understand that enlightenment culminates in Krishna. So how we think is what the Bhagavatam wants us to change. Not just what we think about. Now, so now, how we think, what does it mean? It means our worldview. It means how we look at the world. And it means how we function in the world. It's like sometimes some people might get, they may observe the same thing, but they may come to a completely different conclusion. Or somebody might say, you know, electronic objects, they need smoke to function. Why? Why would you say such a thing? He says, because after smoke comes out of them, then they stop functioning. <laughs> so, what have they done? They completely got the cause effect wrong over there. 
it is not that after smoke comes out they stop functioning it is rather when they stop functioning then smoke starts coming out so we might take a same set of observations but come to a completely opposite conclusion so you know materialistic people may say oh youth is temporary we also say youth it's temporary they say youth is temporary therefore enjoy before your youth goes away i saw an advertisement youth is temporary enjoy before you become a dirty old guy so the facts are the same but the inferences that we draw from those facts they can vary and actually in many ways facts themselves are dead it is ideas that are alive it is the desires that are alive it is hopes and dreams that are alive so if somebody has a house it's a small house it's a big house that's a fact but it is sometimes some so you can have a big house and it's like the house is like a graveyard because the people living over there are completely lonely or suspicious or they have this big house but the only facility that big house provides them is the facility for large space in which to feel lonely and unhappy nothing more than that sometimes people might live in a small house but if their family is well connected and they relate with each other very nicely and there's life over there so just as it applies to objects same applies to the facts themselves are you could say dead but it is ideas that are alive so the fact is that life is temporary youth is temporary that's a fact but what does it imply what is the idea what is the world view that we bring to that fact that is what is important parikshit maharaj was cursed to die in 70s that's a fact but what is the idea of how to live that he brings into those five days that is what is changed so sometimes uh, so people say that okay you practice all the spiritual business but still you you are also going to die you also get diseased so yeah facts facts are what they are the fact that we are going to die is not going to be changed just because we become spiritual but rather how we approach death and of course where we go after death now somebody may say who has seen where somebody goes after death that's okay you may not see where we go after that but you can see how we live before death also uh, a spiritualist life is much more meaningful much more deeply joyful even in this world in the 11th chapter of the bhagavad gita the example is given of two examples basically of how when the virat roop is being shown the kala roop is shown over there in the universal form the time manifestation is shown and the time manifestation यथानदीनां बहोवं मुवेगा समुद्रमेवा विमुखा द्रवन्ति दट जस्ट एज द रिवर इज गोइंग टू द ओशन सिमिलरली अर्जुन इज सीइंग आई सी लिविंग बीइंग एंटरिंग इनटू यू एंड देन ही गिव्स अनदर मेटाफर ही सेस यथा पद यथा पतंगं प्रदीप्तं ज्वलन्ता दट जस्ट एज मॉथ्स एंटर इनटू फायर सो in the shri vishnu sampradaya one of the most prominent successors aaj successor acharyas after ramacharyas vedanta deshika and he has written a sub commentary on the gita so there he gives a beautiful analysis of this to it efforts he said that when a moth enters into fire the moth is completely destroyed its body is destroyed its world is destroyed its life ends but when a river flows toward the ocean two things are there the river is essential nature doesn't change the river is water flowing it enters into the ocean it water keeps flowing and also while the river is flowing it nourishes all the land nearby it nourishes the vegetation nearby it provides water to the people nearby so similarly the example is that the moth rushing towards the fire is like materialistic people living they are rushing towards the fire of death where everything will end for them and at that time their whole world view is completely destroyed their whole world is destroyed what i am living for everything is lost because they may live for money they may live for fame they may live for position 
everything is lost. So, now when we are very attached to something, we may just incorporate everything that we know into that worldview itself. I have written a book on the reincarnation. So, I was asked a question, which was a, probably the funniest question I have been asked in my life till now. What was that question? He said that. So one boy asked me, says, I'm in love with this girl, but somehow, you know, our parents are not agreeing, so we are unable to marry. So what karma can I do by which I can reincarnate in the next life and marry her? <laughs> <laughs> so that I'm a soul, what has happened? Bollywood has had many movies. Which what they have done is they have used reincarnation as a plot point. As a plot twist, basically. So, people have this, the, re, the idea of reincarnation has been romanticized and sensationalized. So, it's, it's, many people have this idea, I want to find my soulmate. Yes, it's good to find a compatible partner. But the idea that, you know, that there is some partner with whom we are going lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And I said, whenever people ask me this question, how I can fi find my soulmate? I said, first, first find your soul. <laughs> <laughs> then you can worry about the mate. <laughs> so, if the basic worldview has not been changed, then the idea of soul and reincarnation simply get imposed on that worldview. And then people just don't really grow much by that. So, we, we need to change how we think. Without that knowledge, See, knowledge, there is knowledge and there is purpose of knowledge. Jnanam, 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 Gamyam, Vridhi Sarvasya Veshtitam in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that there is knowledge, there is object of knowledge and there is objective of knowledge. It's a very interesting distinction. There is knowledge. Say for example, there is engineering knowledge. So now, so, so okay, I got a degree in say electronics engineering. So that is knowledge. The object of knowledge is, okay, I studied computers, I studied television, I studied various electronic gadgets. But while I was studying there, I found that for most students, what was the objective of knowledge? Their objective of knowledge was money, jobs, position, prestige. They wanted to have a, they wanted to have, be top in their class so that they would attract the girls. So the objective of knowledge was very mundane. So the ob what we study and why we study, they're two different things. So what the Bhagavad Gita says is that for a devotee, the object and objective of knowledge both have to be Krishna. We study about Krishna so that we attain Krishna. Now there, when, when somebody is a pious materialist, then they study about Krishna but so that they may come and worship Krishna, they may come and hear Bhagavad Katha. But their purpose is, so that Krishna will make my life in this world better. So the object is Krishna, but the objective is not Krishna. So the Bhagavatam tells us how Parikshit Maharaj made both his object and objective Krishna. Now, if you see, before, before the actual Parikshit Maharaj and Shukde Goswami's pastime starts, there is this whole pastime of, there many pastimes before that, but one of the pastimes which defines the mood of the Bhagavatam is this pastime of Vidura and Dhritarashtra. Vidura and Dhritarashtra have a very um, interesting relationship, you could say. It's at one level very perplexing relationship. So I was giving a seminar on relationships. So he said, if two people have a relationship, how do you know that relationship is successful? So one devotee raised his hand and says, if the people don't kill each other, <laughs> <laughs> that is also one level of success. I said, okay, at least you survive and you live, geo or jinedo as you say, <laughs> live and let live. That is also one level of success. Mm. But, so if you, if two people are in a relationship. Uh, one, one parameter of success, you got a very broad level. You, know, you don't destroy each other. Although sometimes you may feel like doing that. Especially when people frustrate us. They feel like doing that. But then, we could say a success of a relationship is that, that when each of us are in trouble, 
then what happens? We help each other. So, what happens is, he says, if you have good friends, the good friends take you to lunch. Bad friends take your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you have, they take it away from you when they get the opportunity. But, so we could say that when we are in need, as I say, a friend in need is a friend in need. So when we are in trouble, somebody helps us. Mm -hmm. Or when the other person is in trouble, we help them. That's also friendship. So, you know, sometimes trouble comes right upon us. And then we seek help. And if somebody helps us, you can say, oh, this is a person I can count on. But sometimes it may be that, you know, that see, sometimes trouble comes upon us. And sometimes we chase trouble. Sometimes we do things which are going to get us into trouble. Although at that time, we may not per perceive that, okay, this is going to cause trouble. And then, if, if we have a friend, that, that friend may tell us, you know, okay, if you do this, this is going to get you into trouble. Better avoid this. So, uh, another, another say, one, so one level of success, a second level of success of relationship could be that, when we are in trouble, we help each other. Uh, but even more is when somebody is going to doing something that is going to get them into trouble. At that time, a friend warns them, "Don't do this. This is going to get you into trouble." And that is where often the friendship gets tested, because when the trouble is upon us and somebody helps us, yeah, we feel grateful. But when the trouble has not yet come upon us, and we have our own ideas of how things I should be doing, and somebody tells us, "Don't do this," then what happens? Why is this person telling me like this? We often ascribe our own motives to this. You know, maybe. So this is what happens uh, to Ravan that after Hanuman comes and breaks Lanka, burns it and goes back. After that, Ravan calls a assembly of war. He says, our capital has been attacked. So it was half of Lanka Ravan had burned down. Sorry, Hanuman had burned down. So he says, we have been attacked. What do we do? And then he starts by saying, no, a foolish king just acts according to his impulses and makes everyone do what they want, what the king decides. But a wise king seeks advice from his friends, advisors, ministers. And then implied is that I am a wise king. <laughs> but then what happens? Now all his generals speak what he wants to hear. And they say that actually, yes, Hanuman is just a monkey. No, he was able to cause some damage because he caught us unawares. But now that we are prepared, if he comes again, we won't be surprised, he will be surprised. Some people say that actually, you know, we should chase him right now and go wherever he is and we will attack him and punish him. Nobody who attacks Lanka should be allowed to go unpunished. And they all, not one of them addressed the cause, or the actual cause of the aggression, cause of the problem. That is Ram, Ram, Ravan's abduction of Sita. But at that time, there's only one voice of sanity. Whose was that? Vibhishan. Now Vibhishan spoke this and he also knew that this was going to be a difficult conversation. Because generally, when we live with people, we also get a sense of what they like to hear and what they don't like to hear. And generally, if something is unpleasant, we will avoid speaking that. But if something has to be spoken, then we also have to approach it very carefully. So, the, so <clears throat> Vibhishan approaches carefully. He says that, Oh, Ravan, I speak this as your brother and your well-wisher. This is that, oh Ravan, you do not have immunity from humans as well as monkeys. And our current aggressors are both humans and monkeys. And in this case, it is we who are to be blamed. Because we attacked them first. It was we, who, he did not say you did this. He says that we should return Sita because we have abducted Sita. And then he says, we should not forget the power of Ram because alone he destroyed our 14,000 soldiers 
Chand, uh, Rakshasad and Janasthan. And he starts speaking, he makes a very strong case. But at that time, immediately, Ravan says, first Indraji gets up, he says, are you really a Rakshasa? He says, you are afraid of your en our enemies, Rakshasa is fearless. He says, you are so afraid of your enemies and you are creating fear of our enemies within us. Now there is a difference between fearlessness and foolhardiness. The fearlessness is where there is a danger and that the danger is unavoidable, a person fearlessly faces that danger. Foolhardiness is where the person goes into danger, like somebody, if somebody steps off a 10 story building, what are you doing? I am checking gravity works till now. <laughs> well, gravity will work and you will stop working. <laughs> Isn't it? So that is, if some danger is unnecessary, that is not, that is not fearlessness, that is foolishness. That's foolhardiness. So, but when Vibhishan spoke those words, one by one, Ravana Jan Jan General stood up and he continued saying what Ravana wanted to hear. And Ravana rejected what Vibhishan said. He not only rejected what Vibhishan said, he even rejected Vibhishan himself. So now, a similar dynamic is there in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, where Vidura gives good advice to Dhritarashtra. But Dhritarashtra repeatedly refuses to hear. In fact, if you consider this story is very interesting, also for another reason, because traditional cultures were quite hierarchical. Hierarchical means that somebody is in a position, they are to be offered all respect and uh, uh, <coughs> submission. And the whole Bhagavatam's mood is that devotion inverts all hierarchies. In fact, I have a whole class on how Bhagavatam inverts the hierarchies, but let's consider this that somebody who is conventionally, traditionally considered superior and somebody else is considered inferior. But if the inferior person who is considered inferior has devotion, then they become superior to the person who does not have devotion. So this is right now seen in here itself in Dhritarashtra is the king in terms of position as well as age. He is greater. Vidura is not just not the king, he is not even, he is younger, but he is also from inferior birth. Although the same father, but from a lower mother. So in every way is inferior. But we'll see the same theme again. And so normally demons are considered lower than devotees. But there's a pastime in the Bhagavatam, sorry, than the Devtas. But there's a pastime where the demon is shown to be greater than the Devtas. Which is that pastime? Vritrasur. Vritrasur is greater than whom? Indra. Now Vritrasur is a demon, Indra is a Devta. Then there's another pastime after that where a demon is shown to be greater than not just one devata but be better than all the devatas. Which is that? Prahlad. Now all the devatas try to pacify Vishnu, Narasimha, but they're not pacified. He's not pacified, but it is Prahlad alone who pacifies. And normally we have <coughs> Brahmanas are considered higher than Kshatriyas. Sannyasis are considered higher than Grahasthas. But there's a pastime where there's a Grahastha and a Kshatriya who trumps. Maybe I shouldn't use the word trump. <laughs> who, who supersedes a Brahmana and a Sannyasi. Which is that pastime? Yes. Ambarish Maharaj and? Durvasa Muni. So Durvasa Muni is a great sage and he's a renunciate. But when he tries to attack the Ambarish Maharaj, he becomes rendered, is rendered powerless. Sudarshan Chakra starts chasing him. And in the tenth canto itself, we have the, the Yakik Brahmanas and their wives. So the Brahmanas are very good Brahmanas, but when Krishna comes, they don't pay attention to Krishna. Where their wives go? And Krishna blesses their wives. So they are considered higher than husbands. And then of course we have the topmost devotees of the Bhagavata Mother, gopis. The gopis are simple cowherd women, but when Uddhava comes there, now Uddhava is a prince, Uddhava is also a devotee. But he 
he says the gopi's devotion is such that i feel as if i have no devotion at all so the bhagavatam in words all hierarchies so the hierarchies are important for functioning in the world in particular settings particular hierarchies are required but what the bhagavatam shows is if somebody has devotion then no hierarchy will is greater than devotion so similarly over here dhritarashtra is is the king but vidura is although younger in age position and birth he is far higher and what does vidura do vidura has a very difficult task because there are different times we all become blinded see what is blinding mean we all have certain opinions about certain things now our opinion is like say this object suppose this were uh, this is the now this is the phone if i hold it here say i can't see you if i'm holding it here but the closer i bring it if i bring it here then i can't see anything except this phone so like that all of us have opinions but the closer we hold the opinion to us the lesser we can see anything else except that opinion so we all we can't avoid having opinions because we need to function in life and we need to have some functional understandings but we need to hold our opinions lightly not tightly we hold them tightly then we can't perceive anything else so the so uh, now opinion is just another word in this context we can have our opinions we can have our attachments we can have our desires now these are all natural we can have our expectations but none of these can we hold them very tightly if we hold them tightly they blind us if we don't hold them at all that is also not going to work some people nowadays some people have this idea that you know if somebody has any belief okay you believe in god you believe in this religion you believe in this tradition and that will make you narrow minded because then you will have only that belief and you'll not accept anything else it's not like that you know see it's like we need to be open minded but our mind is like our mouth hmm? the mouth should be open to take some food inside but to keep the food inside the mouth also has to close is it <laughs> so like that we need to be open minded to receive ideas but after that we have to hold those ideas we have to mold our life according to those ideas so we need to hold on to ideas opinions but we cannot hold on to them so tightly that we become blind so the trashtra was blind not just physically but also metaphysically and he was blinded by his attachments who was he attached to duryodhan now it's it's uh, at one level natural at another level unnatural so whenever say any parents have a child at that time natural it is it is natural natural in the sense that by nature it is arranged the parents feel a strong affection for their child and among all the species that we humans know about you know human children have the maximum period for caring you know if we have birds birds come out of their shells and the adult bird take care of them for a few months and they start flying on their own but human children need care for a significant amount of time and in that way the now if nature had not provided that that bond between parents and children then the ch- parents would not be able to take care of the children so prabhupad writes that the affection that the parents feel for children is natural and necessary it is natural and necessary but it is not spiritual intrinsically it is not spiritual yes if we see our children as souls and we try we strive for their spiritual well being then it can be spiritualized but it's not intrinsically spiritual so dhritarashtra naturally because he had wanted a son and finally he got a son and in the past kingdoms past especially for kings they also had responsibility of continuing the dynasty so a heir was very important so he thought that duryodhan will be my successor so naturally there was of attachment 
बट वॉट इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन अटैचमेंट एंड एफेक्शन एनी आइडियाज वॉट इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन अटैचमेंट एंड एफेक्शन Attachment leads to frustration. Affection leads to care. Well, but sometimes even people whom we are affectionate to may not listen to us, and then that will also lead to frustration, isn't it? So I, I, you are on the right track. But anything else? Yes, please. Okay, attachment is based on taking, affection is based more on giving. That's a good point. What do we take or give? In the, uh, let's try to apply it to some situation now. We say consider Dhritarashtra and Duryodhan. Now, Duryodhan was his son. What was Duryodhan giving to Dhritarashtra? Frustration. Frustration. Oh. <laughs> Yes. So now he want like like all parents. Yeah. He wanted his son to become a uh, a powerful king, and then what he said that his name, will his legacy will live on. His name will spread. So that's a natural parental aspiration. That's you know, so sometimes parents feel that oh, all that I was not able to do, I want you to do. That's understandable. So the Trashtra he was blind, so he was never officially like the functional king. Even he was nominally the king. He wanted my, let my son to become the king. That's not wrong. That's you could say that's a natural parental aspiration. So, yeah. When the, because the trash was attached, so he couldn't differentiate between the right or the wrong ways to make his son king. So that is because of his attachment. He just want only his son to be the king, whether the right way or the wrong way. Okay, that's a good point. That attachment means that it blinded him to ethics. he wanted his son to be the king at all costs at whether right or wrong now what would affection have meant if he had been affectionate what would it have meant affection uh, when uh, dhritarashtra will love his son he can have a desire to be uh, the king but not following the wrong ways he should guide him this is the right way to do it but not the wrong is that it's affection he love his son but also protecting him not to do the wrong thing okay so affection would mean that he stops him or protects him from doing wrong things at least one eye should be open okay at least one eye should be open that's a good way of putting it <laughs> yes bro thank you i think you're on the right yeah i just got an idea from the people so affection uh, sorry attachment lead to unlimited desire but the affectionate lead to Affection leads you to doing the prescribed duty, but attachment leads to unlimited desires. <coughs> well, okay, but even affection can lead to a lot of desires. We want, we want maybe our loved ones to do a lot of things, to be wonderful, to have. We may have a lot of expectations from our loved ones also. <coughs> I was in America. So I was doing this uh, talk on parenting. So at that time, there was one one uh, lady. She told me that. there's a book called tiger mom tiger mom is about how chinese mothers they are like tigers in trying of protecting and not even protecting just compelling their children to rise way 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 high so you could say that is attachment but they may say that's affection we want the best for our children so and wanting the best for our children it's isn't it, it's it's and we want a lot a lot of things for our children that's not necessarily bad you are on the right track but any one more answer anyone yeah maybe attachment is doing what's best for oneself or is affection is doing what's best for, for both people or for the other person attachment means doing what's best for oneself okay that's true 
but then how was letting Duryodhana go on the wrong track good for the thrust? It, it is the right track. Maybe let me put it this way. I think uh, attach when we are attached, we care more for what the other person thinks about us than what we care for that person. That means we care more for the other person's opinion about us than for the other person's well-being. Let me explain this. Suppose there's a doctor and the doctor has to give the child an injection. The child says, no, this injection will cause me so much pain. I don't want. You are such a cruel doctor. Oh no, this child thinks I am cruel. Let me not give the injection. Now, what is happening over here? The child is caring, the doctor is caring more for the emotions of that person and the perception of that person about me, the child about me, than about the child. Not giving the child the injection may cause far greater pain to the child. So, when we are attached, we can't bear the thought that the other person is not pleased with me. When we are, we are attached, then we are emotionally <coughs> dependent on the other person. And the other person's pleasure with us has to be this, become the center of our life. And we will go to any extreme to make sure that the other person is pleased with me. When we are affectionate, yes, of course, that doesn't mean we want to displease the other person. Obviously not. But then, when we are affectionate, there are limits to what we will do for the other person's pleasure. We also have our values, we also have our principles, we have our purposes, and we also have a concern for the other person. So, if we are emotionally dependent on the other person, then we just can't act in a principled way. So, Dhritarashtra's attachment to Duryodhana was that he just couldn't tolerate Duryodhana being unhappy, and especially Duryodhana being unhappy with him. So, any time Duryodhana wanted to do something terribly wrong, Duryodhana said that these Pandavas, they are becoming very popular. No, we will send them away from our kingdom. He says, how can you send them away? They are my nephews. Says, no, we will send them to Varnavat. And there, they can go as the representatives of our kingdom. They have a beautiful festival over there. And the people of Varnavat will be happy. At least that some, from somebody from the kingdom has come. To be well. We never gone. No, no, we are not. We haven't sent anyone for a long time. But Rasha said, but if they go there, they are popular here already. If you send them there, they'll become popular there also. So he says, then when they come back, they will be even more influential. Duryodhana said, but who says they will come back? Now, Duryodhana was a, Rashtra was a politician. Duryodhana was a politician. So they knew what it meant. So his plan was, they will go there and they will be assassinated over there. Now, Duryodhan, it's a horrifying plan to make. Now they are his own nephews. Now Dhritarashtra was about to speak. And then, the people who are, say, who don't have one sense, say, suppose somebody doesn't have eyes, then the other senses compensate for that. They become very sharp in the other senses. Somebody who can't see, they can hear very sharply. So like that, he immediately could sense that Duryodhana had become very tense. Now his, his own son was committing, was contemplating murder, cold-blooded murder. Now, uh, there, is, there is weakness and there is wickedness. Sometimes people get angry. When they're angry, they may yell at someone, they may shout at someone, they may throw something. And of course, if somebody becomes physically violent in anger, that's bad. It's, it's extremely bad. But still, weakness is where you know, anger suddenly surges up and the person does something wrong. But wickedness is where somebody in a cold, calculated way plans how to hurt the other person the most. So weakness is hot-headed. Wickedness is cold-blooded. Weakness is impulsive. Wickedness is calculative. And 
weakness can be forgiven but to give forgiveness to wickedness is foolishness it's like you know some terrorists are there they are about to kill and then uh, the terrorist gun is empty and there's a there's a security person who just points the gun at them and says oh no no please forgive me please forgive me <laughs> and this police person puts the gun down and the terrorist takes another gun out and shoots him you know when there is wicked see forgiveness is important especially in close relationship we shouldn't hold grudges against each other but when there is wickedness when there is cold blooded calculative attempt to hurt others at that time forgiveness is foolishness at that time that's why you know forgiveness is vital as a individual principle but as a state a state itself cannot be forgiving a state has to function primarily based on justice that's why brahmanas it is so they should forgive but kshatriyas are who are meant to administer justice they are meant to punish and what was uh, arjuna's confusion at the start of the bhagavad gita he was wanting to exhibit brahmanical forgiveness when he had to administer kshatriya justice the pandavas the, the kauravas had done repeated wrongs and not just one wrong two wrongs three wrongs four wrongs it is at least somebody does some wrong and they they realize they are wrong and they apologize for that but duryodhan there is not the slightest apology at all he conspired to burn the pandavas to kill the pandavas to defraud them of their kingdom he sent them to the forest but after that when he came back what did he say and krishna came as shanti dut krishna said just give five villages and what was duryodhan's response do you remember us yes i will not give thank you enough land to input the tip of a needle through that's like saying somebody suppose say we invite somebody to come for a program and he say actually you know i have to go here i have this engagement so i can't come that's they're saying no that's an that's one way of saying no but suppose this if you invite somebody for a program and they say you know even if i die my dead body will never come for your program <laughs> no that is not just a no to the pers- no to the request it's like a no slamming in the face of the person so this was the kind of no he was saying so there's no apology no regret no repentance no reformation at all so he deserved to be punished so now that that extreme came because duryodhan duryodhan was never stopped by the drasht you know the drasht would sometimes make a half hearted attempt to stop him but when duryodhan would duryodhan knew how to push the buttons how to press the buttons how to manipulate this father and he his weakness was that he so because he is so attached attached means he couldn't tolerate duryodhan being displeased with him see being in any responsible position means that sometimes we may have to displease others because we have to take certain decisions and this decision may displease that person now of course sometimes some people make it a dis- business of displeasing everyone you know that is unhealthy but if we if we are if everybody around us is displeased with us then it's quite possible that something is wrong with us now not, not everyone else is wrong it's, it's but the other way is that if we try to please everyone what will happen the only thing that will happen is that we will become miserable it is the easiest way to make ourselves miserable is to try to please everyone so we have to have some purpose some principles and we act accordingly and then some people will be pleased some people will be displeased just by our practicing bhakti some people are going to be displeased what can we do about it so we don't want to displease anyone but we can't make others pleasure or displeasure the sole basis of all our actions so that is attachment now when dhritarashtra had this attachment he just couldn't listen to anyone at all in fact there was a incident where after the pandavas are sent to the forest then the pandavas are furious uh, you know 
Bhim, all of the Pandavas have taken vows to break vengeance on the Kauravas. Bhima has said that I'll break Duryodhana's thigh, I will rip apart Dushasan's arm. Sahadeva said, I'll kill Shakuni. Uh, Arjuna said, I will bring down Karna. And then Duryodhana Dhritarashtra is very fearful. And he, then he, whenever his mind is disturbed, he, he wants some advice. So he calls Vidura. And he says, Vidura, the Pandavas are so angry with me, with my sons. So what should I do now? Dhritarashtra says, he says, Uttarashtra, he says, after you have brought a storm upon yourself, after bringing the storm, how can you expect any good? The Pandas are virtuous and they were so patient. But still you agitated them so much. So what good can come? But at all, if you want to do some good, just call the Pandavas back immediately. Give them all that you have taken from them. And then ask Duryodhan to apologize to them. Ask Duryodhan, Dushas and Karana to apologize to them. Yudhishthir, although Arjun Abhima is angry, Yudhishthir is kind. Yudhishthir may still forgive. And if Yudhishthir forgives, Bhima will not go against him. That is your only hope. And when the Drashtra hears this, he gets angry. He says, you live on my bread, but you always speak things that displease me. He says, the Pandavas and Kauravas, both are your nephews, but you always favor the Pandavas, and you are always against Duryodhan. I have no need for you. Just go wherever you want. And when he hears this, Vidura walks out. And Vidura decides, there is no point staying with Dhritarashtra. So what happens? Vidura also gets on his chariot and goes into the forest where the Pandavas are living. And then when Yudhishthira sees Vidura coming, Bhima as well he gets angry. He says that previously also what had happened when the gambling match was to take place, Duryodhana Dhritarashtra had sent Vidura to come. So he says, now is he calling us for another gambling match? What do we have to lose now? But then he sees Vidura's face and he just immediately gets up off his respect. He says, what is the matter of Khatwa? Another name for Vidura is Khatwa. And then he tells what has happened. And he says, I would like to live with you in the forest. And the, the, the Shri said, that it will be an honor for us to have your association. And then he starts living over there. And the next, see, Duryodhana, Duryodhana is wicked. Where Dhritarashtra is weak. So what happens? He is angry at that time. But after that, what happens? The next morning he wakes up and he starts thinking, what did I do? Now I send my brother, who is always my well-wisher, I send him away. And he calls Sanjay. And he says, Sanjay, please go and call Vidura back. Tell him I am alone over here, I need him. And then Sanjay, Sanjay goes. Sanjay goes and he calls Vidura. And the king is remorseful that he sent you away. He requests that you come back. And now Vidura thinks, should I go back or should I not go back? Now if somebody has rejected us, somebody has spoken hurtful words to us, just why go back to such a person? But Vidura decides to go back. Why is that? Because that is Vidura's love for Vitrashtra. He feels that if I go back, then at least there will be some voice of sanity over there. There are voices which are provoking the trash towards insanity. The voice of the Duryodhana, of the Shasan, of Shakuni. But there should at least be some voice of sanity. Of course, Bhishma was there, but Bhishma was bound by vow. And as a Bhishma could not speak directly against the ruling king. Bhishma had taken a vow that I will serve the ruling king of the Kuru dynasty. And that's why he could express his opinion, but he could not uh, strongly go against him. So, Vidura went back at that time. And that's why, actually, 
we see that relationships often require a lot of commitment. Where we might get insulted, we might get rebuffed, we might get rejected. But if we just take it too seriously, then even small, small things can lead to great problems. So he came back and again he was there as a voice of sanity trying to help him. But what was happening was that although he had respect and regard for Vidura, his attachment to, the, to Duryodhana was too strong. And when Duryodhana was not there, he would hear from Vidura and he would appreciate what he was saying is very good. But as soon as Duryodhana would come, everything he would forget. And then finally, what happened was, just before the Kurukshetra war, now Vidura knew, this is the last attempt I had to do. He told Dhritarashtra that, your son will cause the destruction of the whole dynasty. Abandon him right now, if you want your dynasty to survive. And at that time, Duryodhana gets furious and he says, who has asked you to come over here? O son of a maid servant, while being here with us, you are working for our enemies. Get out of here and take nothing except your life with you. Now, in a hierarchical culture, normally we don't speak strongly against, actually we should not speak harshly to anyone, but what to speak of our elders. So now what happens is that Vidura is on the same level as his father. For Duryodhana to speak like this itself was an outrageous breach of etiquette. But more than that, when Duryodhana spoke like this, Dhritarashtra remained silent. And that was what hurt Vidura the most. The harshest words of our enemies don't hurt us as much as the silence of our friends. Because we know from our enemies, from our critics, what else can we expect? That's what they're going to do. But when we are being attacked, at that time our friends remain silent. Then that is... So that is like a betrayal, that is a terrible letting down. So at that time Vidura decides, enough is enough. Says, he leaves over there. Now, but it's interesting, we see the difference between what Vibhishan does and other than what Vidura does. Vibhishan goes to the side of Ram directly. Vi Although Vibhishan has no relationship with Ram, he forms, at least no relationship directly in that lifetime, but he forms that relationship at great risk to himself. He might be, he might be labeled as an enemy's brother and uh, arrested or punished or even killed. He takes that risk and he goes. But Vidura does not go to the Pandavas side. Although he already has a relationship with the Pandavas. Why is that? Because Vidura still has not given up hope on Dhritarashtra. And he has still hope then. Uh, what has happened is the difference between the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, many differences. I have a whole class on this. But the main in this context, the difference is that the in this case, Vibhishan's brother was the active villain. Whereas Vidura's brother was not the active villain, but he was the passive villain. So, Vibhishan had to take that stand against his brother directly. Because he felt, I am a member of the royal dynasty and I want to show Ram that you know, it is not the Rakshasa that are against you. It is one particular Rakshasa who is against you. He felt that I cannot stop Ravan, but after Ravan is killed, I can ensure that there are other Rakshasas and the Rakshasa dynasty, the Rakshasa kingdom itself is not destroyed. So he goes over to that side. But Vidura, he knows that if he goes onto the side of the Pandavas and if he is a part of the forces who kill Dhritarashtra's sons, then Dhritarashtra's attachment will be so blinding that he will just not be able to hear anything. And thus, he decides not to actively fight against the Kauravas. He just goes on a pilgrimage. And then after the Thrashas, all his sons are killed. And the Thrash is lamenting. At that time, finally, after the lamentation has gone on for a sufficient time, 
then Vidura comes back. Uh, Dhritarashtra had to lose everything before he lost his attachment. Everything he had to lose. Why was that? Because that attachment was blinding him. Like say, if I'm holding this on, holding this on, you know, maybe some stones come, some bullets come and this gets shattered to pieces and there's nothing to hold on to. That's when the blinding will go away. So for Dhritarashtra, he had to lose all his sons. And then when Vidura came, and then when Vidura spoke, that was the time when the words entered. There is Vidura, earlier when his whatever words he would speak, those words were like a lightning. He would hit, they would illuminate, but after it will go away. So we, but when Duryodhana was killed, and afterward Vidura's words were not like lightning, but they were like light. It came and stayed with him. So what the Bhagavatam depicts through this starting conversation is that although Vidura was on the right side, he was devoted, he was virtuous, but even a devoted and virtuous person, it is not just that he could speak and immediately everything would work. There was a challenge, there was a danger. He had to, even he had to wait till the right time. Although Vidura was a pure devotee, he was a wise person. In fact, just like we have Chanakya Niti, which is a set of um, verses which describe very wise sayings of Chanakya, there is Vidura Niti also. Vidura is considered a very wise person also. But even Vidura, his words did not have effect till the right time came. We see that in the life of Srila Prabhupada also. Prabhupada was a great soul, always. But for 40 years, he was speaking spiritual wisdom to Indians and there was no effect. Even in the West, when he came to America for the first six, seven months, there was no effect. But Prabhupada kept speaking. It is not just the potency of the person. Potency of the person is important, but the appropriateness of the time also is important. And the time often determines the receptivity of the person. So sometimes we may want somebody to come on the right track. We may want somebody, say for example, somebody is materialistic, we want them to become spiritual. Yeah, it's important, we desire that and we try to speak accordingly. But sometimes if people are not ready, we shouldn't take that as a personal failure. This person is not, not becoming spiritual, why? Maybe something is wrong with me. Yes, it could be, we can, we, can, we can check whether we are not presenting things properly. But we shouldn't uh, double down on them and try to force them. Because sometimes the time may not be right. And when the time becomes right, if we have meant, so what Vidura did was, that Vidura maintained the relationship even when the relationship was not effective. He could not get Dhritarashtra to, to do the right thing. He could not even stop Dhritarashtra from doing the wrong thing. But still, Vidura did not, re did not just reject the relationship and end the relationship. He kept the relationship and then when the right time came, he was able to give Krishna to Dhritarashtra. He was able to give spiritual understanding. So for all of us, we have many relationships. And when we share, when we share Krishna consciousness with our colleagues, with our friends, with our relatives, sometimes people may just not take up. And sometimes what happens? There is the infamous zeal of the new convert. When we are new to Krishna Bhakti, we just become very zealous. I'll conclude with one story. This is from my own life. I sometimes feel embarrassed, embarrassed about how I used to be maybe 20 years ago. Of course, possibly 20 years later, I'll be embarrassed about how I am now. <laughs> it's always possible. But when I was just introduced to Krishna consciousness after a year or two, there was this one friend of mine. He, he was in the same college and after he uh, graduated, um, after we, I was going to say after we passed out, <laughs> I spoke that with one class in America. After he passed out, people started looking at me as if, you know, because India pass out means graduate, in the West pass out means to go unconscious. <laughs> so why did both of you pass out after we passed out? <laughs> so anyway, after we graduated, both of us got a job in the same multinational company. 
and we would go by the same bus. So my stop was before, so I would get into the bus, and then our two stops later he would join. Now we would do about a one hour ride, and in that one hour ride, uh, I would usually chant or read or hear something. I would not talk with anyone at the ride. They're all materialists. Don't waste time with them. But one day this friend made the big mistake. What big mistake? He asked me, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and when he asked me, at that time, I just you know, gave him the six session Bhagavad Gita course in 45 minutes. <laughs> I started with how you're not the body or the soul, how you know there is a God, and how the devtas are not God, Krishna is God and how bhakti yoga is the best yoga, and how the material world is the place of misery, and how we have to go to the spiritual world, and how all religions give the same message, but Krishna consciousness gives the best message. Everything together. I was actually congratulating myself, how efficiently I have concentrated the whole course in 45 minutes. I didn't even notice that his eyes were glazing. <laughs> and then, after that, Every day when I would get into, get into the bus, when I would climb the bus, then his stop would come. So now the bus has two doors. So he would peep into the door, see where I was sitting. <laughs> <laughs> and then enter through the other door. <laughs> <laughs> so, just I think two years ago I met him in Seattle. His sister was becoming a devotee. So his sister, told him I'm going for this program. His sister is also in Seattle. So, so then, then he heard about it. He said, oh, this is my friend. So he came to meet me. So then we heard, of, we remember, I remembered and I apologized to him for having loaded down on him at that time. He said, no. He, he says, we both laughed at each, both laughed at that time. He's now slowly becoming a devotee. So sometimes we think that we are the doers. So we often sometimes, if we, are, if we are sharing Krishna consciousness, we may also become proudly say, no, I brought this person to Krishna consciousness. I brought 10 people to Krishna consciousness. I brought 15 people, 50 people to Krishna consciousness. Now, we may keep a track of how many people came to Krishna because of us, but we don't keep track of how many people went away from Krishna because of us. <laughs> because of the way we conducted ourselves. So... <coughs> So Vidura had to speak strongly, but he spoke strongly not at the cost of his relationship. He maintained the relationship and then at the right time when this, he spoke strongly, the, the result was there. So we have to see that when we are trying to help someone, it is not we who are helping them. It is Krishna who is helping them through us. And that's why we have Prabhupada in the Markine Bhagavad Dharma. He prays that Alankrita Koribara Khamata Tomar. My dear Lord, please make my words understandable to them. So he's not thinking I'm a pure devotee and I am going to enlighten all these ignorant souls. No, his idea is that Krishna, you are in their hearts. Tomar ichaye hoy sab maya varsh. Tomar ichaye nash maya rabarash. It is by your will that people are where they are right now. They are an illusion. It's not by the Krishna's will doesn't mean Krishna wants them to be an illusion. But it's within Krishna's plan. And if you so desire, then you will make my you will get them out of illusion and you will make me an instrument for that. So we so when we are attached. We simply go along and do whatever the other person wants to do. Hmm? When the, another opposite of attachment is detachment. But in this case we could say the opposite of attachment could be just not caring at all. Now detachment doesn't mean that we don't care for the other person at all. You, know, oh, you don't do what I am doing, so get lost. Hmm. Not like that. So what we do is, there is attachment, you could say there is detachment and there is commitment. So Vidura was committed to Dhritarashtra. Committed doesn't mean that I will do whatever you want me to do. But uh, it also doesn't mean that oh, you are not doing what I am telling you, get lost. No, committed means he did what he could to make Dhritarashtra's cease sense. 
And Dhritarashtra was not ready. Vidura kept his distance. But he did not reject Dhritarashtra. He did not end the relationship. And then when the right time came, because he was committed, now Vidura had no reason to again come back to the kingdom. He had no guarantee that again he would not be insulted and rebuffed. But he tried. And at that time, eventually he succeeded. So, it is that commitment that will take us to Krishna and that commitment that will take help us take others to Krishna. We, um, whenever we have any relationship, we shouldn't, like I say, if we, are, if we are parents and we take care of our children. Now we want our children to grow up to be good human beings, good devotees. That's natural. But we can't make our relationship with our children conditional to their becoming devotees. A devotion is a choice which they have to take. And if you force them right now, what will happen is a little bit, a little bit pushing, pushing is natural for everything. But if you force them too much, then they will remember Krishna as something which is forced on them. And that is not a very pleasant memory to have about Krishna. If we maintain our relationship, if we give them positive remembrances, positive memories about Krishna consciousness, then even if they don't practice bhakti very seriously right now, those memories will bring them to Krishna. If we think that Sometimes what happens? We start thinking that somebody, if I am, I am preaching to, that person should become a devotee and that person becomes a demonstration of my potency, of my purity and my potency. So like that, we want our children to be devotees so that, and so, oh, what a good devotee I am. My children also become devotees. Yes, it's natural we want our children to be devotees. But the important thing is that it is not we who are going to make them devotees. It is Krishna in their hearts and Krishna can use us as agents. And sometimes Krishna can, may make them devotees without using us. Maybe more than the vertical, we telling them something, the literal might work better. This, they are with other children who are also practicing bhakti. Then that may inspire them more. So we definitely provide them all the facilities, but we cannot force them. If we force them, then when they grow older, they become free, they will go away from Krishna. And they will have unpleasant memories about Krishna. But instead, we give them the facilities, we give them the good memories, and eventually when the right time comes, then, if we have maintained a relationship with them, then they will come. Sometimes if you say that, no, you are wrong, and you are doing this, one day you will regret this. You are going now, one day you will come crawling back on your knees. And you will admit to me that I was right. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we make the relationship in those terms, what will happen is, even if they realize they are wrong, they will not come back. Because it's become like an ego issue for them. So when there's love, it's natural to have expectations. But we can't make the love conditional to the expectations. Yes, I'm committed to this relationship. I'm there for you. Now, if you don't want, if you take this up, I'll be happy. Naturally, happier, but if not, still I am there for you. So when they see that when we are committed to a relationship, then we will, we will provide the facility, but we will also have the patience for the right time to come. Similarly, when we are preaching to others also, sometimes we push people so much that we want to push them toward Krishna, but they get pushed away from Krishna. I say, people are not coming, not coming, uh, not taking up seriously, okay, whatever level they are at, accept them at that level. Krishna is also working in their hearts and Krishna will take them to, take them higher gradually. So that way, when we work, then we can all be, be able to do what is required to help a person to grow in their spiritual life. And thus, we can become agents for Krishna, as Vidura became an agent for Krishna to enlighten Vidrashtra. So I'll summarize. I spoke on this topic of you know, how Vidura enlightened Dhritarashtra and how did Dhritarashtra become experienced that was we talked about yeah. <coughs> I started in this talk by explaining that it is our judgment that makes us experience not just having experiences so Dhritarashtra was immensely attached to Vidura to, to Duryodhan and that attach, he hold on, held on to that attachment very tightly, so it blinded him to everything else. Attachment means that we, affection means we are concerned about the other person. Attachment means we are concerned about 
what the other person thinks about me. Attachment means we are emotionally dependent on that person and for getting that person's pleasure, we will go to any extremes. Now, because of that, Duryodhan did horrible things and Dhritarashtra acquiesced to them. And thus he was destroyed by that. Now, I talked about when we are practicing bhakti, the Bhagavatam demonstrates how bhakti can be shared in different ways. So, although Vidura is younger, but Vidura younger in age, younger in lower in position and lower in birth, but still he was able to enlighten Dhritarashtra. The Bhagavatam demonstrates the inversion of hierarchy throughout. How devotion makes one superior to those who are otherwise material superior to us. But that superiority is not to be like imposed on others, it has to be cautiously exercise. So Vidura was rejected by Dhritarashtra and Vidura went away, but he still came back because he was committed to that relationship. He wanted to be the voice of sanity. But eventually when Duryodhan insulted him directly and Dhritarashtra remained silent, he went away, but he did not go against Dhritarashtra's sons because then that would have, that attachment would have blinded him to hearing any words of counsel from one who had been a party to who, those who killed his sons. So he just went on pilgrimage and then he came back again. And then when he spoke strong words, he was able to enlighten the Dhrashtra. So sometimes the, whether a person changes or not doesn't depend only on our potency. It also depends on the appropriateness of the time, the receptivity of the person. And we need to let Krishna act also. So Prabhupada also, his preaching was effective after 40 years of relatively ineffective outreach in India. And Prabhupada did not see that I am a pure devotee going to enlighten everyone. He saw that Krishna make my words understandable to you. So if we have that mood, then with our loved ones, we will facilitate them to come to Krishna. And if they are not ready, still we will be committed and we will maintain that relationship. And then when the right time comes, then we will be there to help them come to Krishna. If we try to impose Krishna consciousness on others, they will get alienated. And when we uh, see ourselves not as making a devotee, but being a part of Krishna's plan to help them become devotees, then we will act in a mature way to do what Krishna wants us to do in that particular service. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So any questions or comments? Yes. So I was just wondering whether that principle <coughs> could apply to um, devotees joining ISKCON and how uh, my experience in the early days when the devotees became brahmacharis because the mood was you should join the temple and cut yourself full time but then many of those devotees eventually fell back material energy and had some resentment that they um, they over committed when they weren't mature in their realizations. Do you understand the question? Okay. Yeah, it's a <coughs> difficult question. So some devotees who committed to um, the movement in the early days, then they couldn't continue, they had to go back to material life and they felt that they over committed at that time. And they may, they may have some regrets about what they did. Yeah, I think that's understandable. Because broadly speaking, our movement started at a historically very unusual time. That means it was a time when there was a counterculture and there are people who Many, many young people at that time were rejecting the mainstream society and they were looking for some alternatives. So, it was not that, uh, not everyone, but a good number of people at that time, they were people who had already rejected an education, a career, a family. Prabhupada says in lecture that the hi uh, hippies, they had already done, done Sarva Dharmaan Parityaj. I taught them how to do Maa Mekam Sharanam <laughs> <laughs> they had given up all their duties, but just giving up duties is not enough. You know? <laughs> they had to give up duties that come in the way of our Krishna Bhakti. 
and then we have to take up krishna bhakti more seriously so now some of those those would anyway have uh, many of them were on a course to disaster and prabhupad came in even from a material perspective not just a spiritual perspective a material perspective also uh, getting hooked to drugs can be horrible so prabhupad came and gave them krishna krishna bhakti and that's how they were able to they were saved from the disaster course but uh, krishna at that time practicing krishna bhakti basically meant that because the krishna bhakti culture and the mainstream culture were so radically different that the way to practice it was just to move to the temple and that's the way it was practiced and as long as prabhupad was there and the zeal was there you could practice it but after some time you know, that level of practice uh, is not sustainable for most people see the renounced order is something which is uh, even in vedic times if you see even in, in the bhagavatam how many of the sages in the bhagavatam are renunciates we see shamikrishi he is not a renunciate we see so many of the sages vishwamitra was earlier uh, not a renunciate so we cannot change the natural order of things and certainly not in kali yuga so most people will have to will have to evolve organically that means if there is the grahastha ashram and then the gradually the organically renunciation comes up so at that time because circumstantially there had been a upsurge of renunciation not exactly renunciation in the vedic sense but just a rejection of mainstream society and prabhupada channeled that and directed those people towards krishna now in general it is not just those who came to krishna consciousness they after some time felt that we need to go back to material life but if you see uh, most of the hippies you know, they went on spiritual journey not not most a good number of hippies they went back to, went on spiritual journeys and they did this and they did that and after some time they returned back to mainstream society and many much of silicon valley has been built by many of the pioneers of social media and other stuff all that you know they were people who had had they were a part of the hippie generation so i would say it was just a phase and prabhupada krishna arranged for prabhupada to be there at that time and that phase was expertly tapped by prabhupada but uh, what was done at that time was naturally not sustainable it just uh, uh, we have to each of us has to we, in our tradition we often focus on the intensity of practice of bhakti you know we have to practice bhakti seriously we practice intensely now intensity is important but intensity has to be balanced by sustainability say for example today is ekadashi now some of us may be fasting now yeah fasting is a challenge and we might fast but if somebody says fast every day because you are fasting one day so excuse me fasting one day so fast every day no that's not going to work so intensity is possible in a phase in certain times but we have to we have to find out how we can practice bhakti sustainably and there are times when prabhupada also has spoken now it's the time to boil the milk prabhupada says that now we have enough temples now we need to nourish the devotees but somehow what happened was that at that time the because in youth everybody has a lot of passion within them so because of that passion it is like a juggernaut that has started you know expand build more temples or get more devotees distribute more books prabhupada also encouraged that because that's the way he was channeling the passion within us but then prabhupada did give some cautionary statements but the momentum was such that that those cautionary notes were not really heard so well so i think each of us has to find our own way to move forward jayadwait maharaj gave a series of talks on <laughs> is called it's the series of called unity in perversity what it means not unity in diversity <laughs> unity in perversity <laughs> so what he means by that is that in general he is talking about christianity islam gaudiya vaishnavism and gaudiya math anything any religious movement that starts with a charismatic founder after that charismatic founder departs there is chaos it just the way things work so after the chaitanya mahaprabhu departed this chaos 
this it took some time for it was adhacharya and tanand prabhu they had two groups and their followers were quite uh, at loggerheads so it took some time for the peace to be established where it took for the christian for the church it took 400 years to decide who was jesus after jesus died then in the icin creed they, un- they understood that they decided what the identity of jesus was so it is gaudiya mat also after bakta sanskrit got divided as a yes cubes so relatively speaking what happened within our, with our tradition with our movement is not at all unprecedented it was to be expected in fact we could say that things could have been even worse because in the history of religious movements never has there been any instance where the gap between the founder and the successor was so great the founder was born in a very cultured family was lived very purely throughout his life founder was in the 70s and the successors were in the 20s and 30s you know and the founders the successors were from a different different culture different language different religion we we could even say that uh rather than consider that actually our movement after prabhupada's departure was set for disaster so rather than asking you know did we over, did we make some mistakes or something at that time it's we can say that actually you could say it's a miracle that our movement not only survived it survived and, it's, and has expanded also so that shows the resilience of the krishna bhakti tradition and the resilience of the devotees who have carried the tradition forward so rather than looking at the past and thinking we overcommitted we just have to understand that we have to practice bhakti in a way that is sustainable for us and we find that out what it is for us mm. and over a period of time even those who are preaching they also need they will also become balanced so there is uh, i gave a class once on preaching in the three modes and preaching in transcendence so preaching in which so what i did at that time you know trying to dump everything on that my friend i would say that is at best preaching in passion that is not preaching in goodness at all they can be preaching in ignorance preaching in ignorance means like you know i am preaching to someone and then somebody else comes and says oh this person seems to be a promising person they say, pull that person away and my person no my person and both of them are pulling this person says i am my own person i am going now <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes it happens you know disciples of two gurus they want ah oh, this person should buy, become take any sin from my guru from any sin from my guru and that person say i don't want to take any initiation i'm just going <laughs> <laughs> so it can happen unfortunately like that so i would say that the activity of uh, bringing people to krishna is transcendental but how we do the activity may not be transcendental so we have to find out ourselves how we can practice bhakti in a way that is intense but also is sustainable thank you mm-hmm. any other questions or comments yes so, um, just, uh, elaborate on um how one based on the point that you made that forgiveness of uh, wickedness is foolishness how do you reconcile that with forgiveness to make Okay, good question. If to make advancement in Krishna consciousness, we need to forgive. Uh, but then, how can I say that forgiveness of wickedness is foolishness? I think there's a different context over here. At the very least, we can say that the same Bhagavad Gita, which tells Arjuna, "Tam si tikshu subhar," the tolerate. that same bhagavad gita is followed by arjuna fighting a war so krishna doesn't tell arjuna that that tolerate does not mean oh arjuna you tolerate the atrocities of the kauravas <coughs> why not you forgive the kauravas forgiveness can definitely be given but there is a difference between forgiveness as a intention and forgiveness as a action so okay let me put it another way that forgiveness is a very very important virtue and we very much lack it in today's world and sometimes people hold small small grudges i was in canada and i was staying with a devotee couple so the husband does yagyas you know he does vivaha yagya and very sick he is like he is a software professional but he also is a marketing person he is also learned as a priest the husband does these sacrifices 
and his wife is a family lawyer. So they say we are a complete package. You come to us when you want to get married, you come to me, and when you want to get separated, you go to her. <laughs> so anyway, so this wife, this mother, was telling me that uh, sometimes, especially in the Western world, people get separated over such small, small things. He's telling that this woman came to him, and he says, you know, I, I, want, to, I want to get separated. He says, why? Yeah, she said, today morning I went to a restroom and I, our restroom and I saw that my husband had used my toothpaste without my permission. He says, because of that you want to get separated. Now you could say there's a backstory behind that. But that was a trigger. Now what is, what is foolishness? So now I said, are you joking? He said, no, I'm dead serious. He says, she says my conscience didn't allow me. He said, I cannot, I cannot do this. She said, you go to some other lawyer, some, some other uh, family lawyer for this. She said, I rejected that case, but she eventually went and did that. So, so we do need to keep small things small. So definitely, forgiveness is very much required so that we don't make small things into very big things. But at the same time, not all things are small. Some things are big. And if somebody is coming in the way of some big thing, then we cannot just forgive because they will keep doing the wrong thing again and again. Say, an example could be that suppose somebody is uh, going in a train. In India, we have these locals and metros, and the capacity is 50, but there are 300 people in that. So everybody is squeezed. Mm, understanding. Now, now in every group of people, there are some people who tend to be bullies. So somebody starts, we are standing and somebody starts pushing us. Start pushing us. I think you things are so strong, I'll show you how strong I am. And we start pushing back. And they push us. And we push them. And we get so busy in pushing each other, that our station comes and goes and we're still pushing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is foolishness. But, you know, okay, you want your space, I just move somewhere else. It's just a short journey. It's a small thing, keep it small. There's no need to get back and hit back at the person. So the big thing is we want to get to our destination. But suppose that person starts pushing us out of the train itself, while the train is moving. Then that's not a small thing which you can tolerate. Oh, you want to push me, push me. At that time you have to take a stand. We have to either... Uh, raise an alarm, we have to call others, call the authority, or at least we have to move away from there and go somewhere else. So that time we cannot just be passive and tolerant and forgiving. So if somebody is coming in the way of the big thing for us, then we have to take a stand. So <clears throat> if somebody say, now when Duryodhan was trying to dishonor Draupadi publicly, now that was a particular limit was crossed at that time. So at that time, for, it was the time was well beyond forgiveness because it was a, it was a, it was a horrible activity to do, and there was no remorse at all afterward. So sometimes, if somebody has done something terribly wrong, and if they do not get the consequences of their actions, then they will keep repeating those actions. They will hurt us, and they will hurt others. So at an individual level, so when we talk about forgiveness, I said there's a difference between forgiveness as an intention and forgiveness as an action. So what that means is that when somebody has hurt us and then we, we seek justice against them, we are not motivated by vengeance. No, you did this to me, so now just see what I'm going to do to you. So that becomes like a personal agenda against them. So devotees should never be vengeful. But if somebody has done something seriously wrong, something grievously horrifyingly wrong, then to stop to make sure that others don't do something like that, that they don't do the same thing to others like that. Sometimes they need to be given the consequences of their actions. But that is not done because you did this to me. This is so that you don't do this again, you don't do this to others. So in terms of intention, a devotee doesn't have a revengeful agenda against anyone. But in terms of action, sometimes if we are in a position of protecting something, and if somebody is intruding on that, hurting, attacking that, then we may have to take strong action. 
So it depends on what is the big thing for us. And not just in subjective sense, but in terms of our life and its values and our purposes. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna in the 11th chapter tells Arjuna that he reveals how all your enemies are killed by my arrangement. He says, these are your enemies, your Shatru, and they're all killed. That is 1132-33. But in the same chapter, 22 verses later, the last was 1155 is, Arjuna, you should work in without any animosity towards anyone. Then you will come to me. Nirvairaha sarva bhuteshu yaha samameti pandava One who works without animosity towards anyone, that person will come to me. He said, just now you showed that these are my enemies and they are going to be killed and you want me to fight against them. And now you are telling, don't have any animosity. So what is going on? So a devotee may fight against someone, but a devotee is not against someone. So we are, we are not having a vengeful agenda against them. So the Pandavas had nothing personally against the Kauravas. The Pandavas, if they had wanted, they fought the war not to take revenge. Although sometimes in the heat of the moment they might speak words like that. But if they had been wanting to f- t- take revenge, then they would not, had not have sent the Pav, sent Krishna as the Shanti Dut. They would not have sought peace on extremely accommodating terms. They, if they fought the war not to take revenge, but to establish Dharma, to establish justice, to, to establish the principles of virtue and justice. If a person, you know, some say, <coughs> what Duryodhana and the Kauravas did was, who against Draupadi, that was like a horrifying violence against a uh, respectable woman. Now, if somebody uh, does violence like that, normally some, if some criminal wants to do it, they do it in, they, they, they do it in private, when there will be no victim, there will be no evidence, no witnesses. Imagine somebody does that in public. That means they are so brazen. Imagine if somebody comes to the police station and then they, violate a woman publicly like that. That means they have no fear of law at all. So the Kauravas did this to the Pandavas in the assembly. In the assembly where people would come to seek justice. That means they had no fear at all. So for such people, that means if the, if the gangsters have become so fearless that they can commit crime in the police station, then that means those gangsters have to be curbed. So the Pandavas fought to establish justice. So to establish dharma and to have justice, the rule of a just rule to be there in the kingdom. So at individual level, we forgive. That means we don't have an intention to get back at the other person because of what they did to us. But we have to make sure that people don't keep hurting others and people don't keep doing the wrong thing again and again. For that purpose, we may have to fight against them. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Shri Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki. Gaur Prima. Gaur Prima. Gaur Prima. Gaur Prima.